Welcome, welcome, to those effects. welcome to the Ethos Effect podcast. podcast. After building and learning from failures, we discovered our ethos and leveraged it to, to scale, sell, and build again our seven figure businesses. Whether you're starting out or leveling up, this podcast is your source for innovation and lasting impact. Hey, everybody. Thanks for checking into the Ethos Effect podcast. We are here today with Piero Nunez Del Risco. But before we get into that interview, Donna and I are just going to give you a little brief summary of what went down. Super interesting interview. What I loved was um, the story about Pana. So Pana is a bank specializing in Latin American immigrants coming into this country. And he talks about some of the difficulties banking when you come in and you not yet are assigned with a Social security number, Mm -hmm. something I know you went through as well. So navigating that, making it easier to send money back and forth. Um, And what I loved was the story of his prior startup. Yeah. His prior startup, he had some um, opportunities is what Donovan likes to call them. I call them just straight up failures. But what was really beautiful was Piero so vulnerably shared what went really well and what maybe didn't in that and how that forged his path forward with Pana. Um, what a cool dude. I honestly feel like he is going to be an absolute superstar giant business owner, like very quickly. Pana's incredible. Yep. The mission behind it, his drive, his focus. He was also the head of digital banking for Scotiabank. Um, so he what I find really interesting about his journey is he used, you know, the very corporate world to learn and then to go to his market, which was Latin America, and bring those same solutions. So yeah, let's get into it. Yeah, I love when people, um, what I find interesting is like when people have this idea and he had this idea that he wanted to start a bank. And I'm like, that's such like a kind of like an obscure dream to to most people. But like, that's what he thought he wanted to do. He's freaking doing it. Um, he talked about not the failure, but he called it the learnings, which I agree with him. Mm-hmm. You, either, you, either, you either succeed or you learn. And those, yeah. are, those are kind of the two things we talked about. Um, but going through that process terming that deciding that baby was ugly and, and that he had to <laughs> he had to close up shop and then rebounding to something that is working very well very quickly for him so super exciting let's get into it welcome to this week's episode of the ethos effect podcast i'm your host chelsea Rikus, joined with my husband donovan and super important today we have an amazing guest mr piero nunez del risco a fascinating background. I'm not even going to try to get into it. I'm going to let him tell you because it is so good. So, well, I'll, I'll say what you are right now. You are the CEO and the founder of Pana, which we're going to get really deep into that. But right before the camera started, we were talking about what happened before that, which is your time at Scotiabank as the head of digital banking for the Scotiabank Digital Factory. And it's already turning out to be a really good story. So can we back up and start there before we get into your app? Absolutely, okay. and it, it, it's 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 so it's so obviously. Thank thank you so much for the invitation. I'm yeah. happy to be here. Um, so yeah, I think when you try to connect the dots, obviously looking backward, it, it, a lot of that makes sense. Um, but I remember that I had started out as a kind of like the black sheep of my family because my families are from an artist background my dad worked on tv my brother in advertising my cousin he's a singer so everyone's like on, on media in the and, dominican republic yes and i did my my stints at tv and stuff and i kind of like get the gist of it but i always liked business and i always knew i could speak i could talk i could sell i could dream big i had big ambitions and stuff but I, I liked business. So I, I started a journey where I tried to train myself towards that future I wanted to have, which was be one of the maybe most relevant and biggest CEOs that had a big impact on a, a big population. So that's how my journey started. I worked at banks, insurance company, investment funds. I did my first fintech. It had some successes. It also had some learnings. <laughs> All <laughs> so, the good ones do. Yeah, but... <laughs> Obviously, learned a lot from that. But to that Scotia piece, um, I, we had decided that we wanted to take a new step into something, a bigger stage. We, had, we, wanted, we wanted to have an impact on on a bigger forum. And mm-hmm. 
like my wife and I, we had decided that we wanted to kind of like move out to some other country, maybe the U.S., maybe Europe, and and build a company, build a new life or whatever. So I had written an email to Scotiabank, like when I discovered they had this concept called Digital Factory. And I, and I wrote them this email saying, hey, you guys should bring this concept to Dominican Republic. It's going to be so interesting. And it's going to be big. And I could help you bring that, whatever. No one answered. <laughs> I think it went junk mail or whatever. Probably, yeah. So fast forward X amount of years. And I'm at this point in my life where I want to, you know, take this leap into the 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 international spectrum. Uh, suddenly, I get in, in, in my LinkedIn inbox, I get a message from Scotiabank HR department. And they said, like, we are looking for a head of digital banking for Caribbean, Central America, and Uruguay. And it sounds like you fit the profile. <laughs> did they find you <laughs> randomly or did... Did that email get? get I'm sure that email away? didn't did not get there okay. because it was so long ago. But okay. no, they just they just. In fact, they had just decided to 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 build that division in the DR, and they they just went ahead and, and looked me on Instagram and on LinkedIn. Sorry, and 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 found me. So you're like, good idea. I had this idea five years ago. <laughs> I'm like, you have no good idea. Good job. <laughs> let, let, me, let me leave that aside and not bring it up because you never know if it could backfire. Totally. But anyway, um. Yeah, and and it started this amazing journey because I had been in financial sector, I had been in startup life, and this big international bank hires me to lead their innova innovative division of digital banking. And that was the perfect setup for my dream job, for my dream milestone, which was Pana. So it 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 somehow it came about beautifully mm -hmm. and in a, in a way that you obviously you cannot plan it, and and I think that every time a an idea gets its moment, that's more powerful than anything else. That's super powerful. So when you were starting with Scotiabank, when they had reached out, did you already have the idea for for Pana? Or you just, it was kind of the right industry, it was the right path that you were looking to get started on. So my first fintech was a personal financial manager, my first startup. And that was um, kind of like I, we raised cash from investors, from angel investors in DR. We built it, we took it to market, we learned a lot. Misuma? And Misuma, yeah. Misuma. And we, we actually shipped it. And again, the regulation wasn't there. I think it was a little bit ahead of its time because now the regulation allows it to be and to flourish and to scale, but the regulation wasn't there back then. Um, and I tried to kind of like migrate it or evolve it into a neobank uh, or, or what today is an, it's called a neobank. And, but the regulation wasn't there, by, but I did my research uh, nonetheless. So I knew how to build a neobank in the U.S., but I wanted to do it in DR, right? Mm -hmm. So one day at Scotiabank, we're doing super well. Obviously, it's the, you know very, it's a very good role that I have. The seniority, you get a chance to learn everything. It was it was a, a fantastic experience. And one day they offered me to, if I wanted to move with my family to Toronto for another role, which is kind of like a, a kind of like even a, a kind of like a promotion. And I said, well, I love that. I, I, I always wanted that. But hold on. I'm 36. I was 36 back then. And I said, if I take this role now, I'm going to have to give it maybe three, four years of my life mm -hmm. because of the compromise, right? So, and the age has nothing to do with this, but I said, if I'm 40 and I've never done my neobank, my dream startup, I'm going to regret it for the rest of my life. Wow. And and I have the savings, I have the age, I have the momentum, mm -hmm. I have everything going on that if I, I, I resign from Scotiabank, you know, I could still get a, a, another job like it. So I said, this is the moment. This is the moment to take that leap. Uh, wow. My wife has ju had just given birth to our second child. So she wanted to kind of like, she wasn't she, that she wasn't happy. Feeling the same. Like, Maybe this isn't the right time. Yeah, you know, <laughs> stability, you know, uncertainty. But 
Oh, uh, but obviously she she supported me mm-hmm. and 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 said it it had some lobbying and stuff it had some negotiations but she ended up obviously supporting this this dream and, and we said this is the moment this is the time let's wow. let's lo- let's do this now and all out of a promotion so a thing that was supposed to be a good thing you realize like okay it's I, it's time for me to get I did the contrarian thing yeah you know at that point you would do no, no, I'm staying here. I steady job, steady income, mm-hmm. savings, whatever. And in fact, I said one of the one of the things of this the steady jobs is that four years in, that's that was another thing I, I I thought. I said in four years, I'm gonna be making maybe X much. Starting up <laughs> at 40 when you have this much or what is this going on, it's gonna be tougher. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because Golden you're handcuffs. more comfortable. Yeah. It always gets tougher as yeah. time goes on if you don't do it. What do you think with, so I'm, I'm super curious because you're very clearly an entrepreneur at heart, right? And then to go and work for a massive corporation while you were obviously leading an innovative, disruptive division, you're still part of a corporate environment, right? What were some of the biggest differences that like maybe that you liked or didn't like about working for somebody else versus disrupting your own self and industry with your own business? So I, I, I my now wife, I told when she was my girlfriend, like maybe 15 17 years ago, I told her one day, you know, one day I'll have my own bank. And I, I, I kid you not, you, you could ask her. It's, <laughs> Probably it's, laughed. It's, yeah, it's, and I, I kind of like always knew what I wanted to do. And it was just a matter of preparing myself to go ahead and do it. When I worked at, at Scotiabank and the previous great institutions that I worked for, I, I did it consciously to train myself to understand what is it like to be in a company like that? And and there's this school of thought that if you worked at a company like that, maybe you're you, you don't have the innovative perspective. But I I said I I disagree. I think you could have a much you know comprehensive point of view mm-hmm. and diverse point of view if you've seen the corporate and the startup, the you know. The slow movers and the fast movers, mm-hmm. the the right. big and small. If if you have that, I think you have a a richer and broader perspective. So one of the things that was very interesting was understanding a couple of things like how they how these big institutions think, why they move at the speed that they do, and when you're managing other people's money, for instance, and the regulation is so tough, you understand why not. Any VP is going to make a decision that you might think is the best one, but the risk rewards and the incentives for they, them to take the risk versus lose their, lose their great job is not perfectly aligned. Right. But again, you're you're managing other people's money, so it's understandable. So mm. you could get to get a grasp and understand what is it like, right? Mm-hmm. And then what is it like to scale and to manage a company that big and to manage the culture when it bigs. So. I think it was it was kind of like a conscious effort to start training myself for that role that I, that I aspired to have one day. Mm-hmm. I mean, the great thing about it it's it's literally paid education, right? You were there working your job, getting paid very well, and and just taking it all in. Absolutely, right? and 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 you learn so much, right? Yeah. And and especially when you're taking notes, when you're you're, you're consciously mm-hmm. trying to, you know. Uh, learn and understand and know people yeah. and, and, and compare and contrast um, all those concepts that you have when you were going in. So I love it. That's like the number one thing we look for when we're hiring people too, is not necessarily because they want to do it on themselves, but like they're open to that. There's so many people that go into things and they're just like, once they've done it for like two years, now I know it. Yeah. And now I'm an expert I'm gonna, and I'm going to go do it and this do way. it. That's what I find so interesting about how intentional you were with the decisions you made and the comment you made earlier about uh, your first company being ahead of its time. And then you also mentioned that after the Scotiabank starting your Pana, that the timing had worked out. Like you can have an amazing idea, but if it's not the right time, like that seems to truly be, you know, it's, uh, we had Michael Gordon, the founder of telemedicine on our podcast. And his whole thing was um, like, ideas are great, but implementation is obviously like more important than the idea itself. And I feel like timing is such a key piece of that implementation. Um, I had some questions about, can you tell our listeners exactly what Pana is, what it does, so we can get everybody up to speed on that? Absolutely. We're building a digital bank for uh, the 62 million U.S. Hispanics. Um, 
we internally we call it a challenger bank. Uh, some call it a neo bank, but in the end, it's a digital banking app for focused on on the 62 million U.S. Hispanics. You can open a checking account with just your passport um, and send remittances to 82 countries. And we consciously focus on this first the first year when you're you come into the country and you're still getting your SSN or your ITIN number, and it's hard to get a bank account and or many other services. Been and there. that's 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 where we started because I went through that and I felt very uncomfortable when I had to start from scratch. I felt like I was no one. Mm -hmm. And and you know, we had already built great banking tools for Caribbean and Central America. We said, wait a minute, we can fix this. And it turns out it was not just that the state of banking for U.S. Hispanics is not what it should be for, especially for 20 million U.S. Hispanics. Mm -hmm. But we realized it was kind of like around the pandemic. So post-pandemic, we realized that millions of people just like me had default borderless financial lives, but their financial products were geographically limited. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you see a person who has a product in Peru and U.S., mm -hmm. or in my case, I have credit cards from DR and I have products in the U.S. So I have a completely borderless financial life, but my products are, are limited. And think about remittances, $150 billion a year moved from U.S. to LATAM, and 83% of that is still cash, and we're changing that. Oh, my gosh. That's incredible. Yeah, and, and there's no financial inclusion there. There's no credit building. It really sucked when I came into the country and I had my good credit score back in DR. And here, hey, no, you got to get a secure credit card. <laughs> and then you got to wait a year until you stop being credit thin. And I'm like, but go ask this folks yeah. from DR. They're going to tell you I'm, I'm credit like I'm worthy. legit. Yeah. I'm legit. And it's like, I don't care. The system just, you're a number. Oh. So we need to change that. So... A couple of things, obviously, touching on the market of people that are new to the U.S. Chelsea went through that as well, coming to Canada, so not having their identification numbers um, yet to open a bank account. Obviously, very important. What are the the other kind of cultural differences? Do you think, or maybe obstacles or hurdles with Hispanics moving to the U.S. or maybe just how they do banking differently? I know, like. In Puerto Rico, they seem to have like this emphasis on, um, it's called uh, ATH Mobile. It's like a, a transfer app, and it's just everywhere. And I don't quite know what, what or why or or what's going on. Um, are there differences either like in the countries and their laws and regulations, or is it just a difference in in how people handle their money? Culture. Yeah. So U.S. Hispanics, maybe the if you take the GDP of the sixty million U.S. Hispanics, is probably the fifth. Uh, kind of a, a world economy. Mm -hmm. It's the most diverse. It's growing. It's 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 th thriving, and not from an economic perspective only, but also from a demographic perspective. But you have many subcultures, you know, nationalities mm -hmm. within it, so it's very diverse. We have focused on taking the common aspects of the cohort, things that are very much alike, where we are all are all alike and not where we're different. For instance, pana, which means pal, translates as pal in English, okay. goes through that same, you know, we as Hispanics and Latinos, we're, we're warm. We're, you know, we're, there's this community aspect to us. Right. There's there's sharing aspect to us. There's this Good Samaritan aspect that I don't know you, but I just know you, but you're my partner now. You're my pal. Now I'm going to help you. I'm going to be that helping hand when you come into a country and et cetera. So if you look at finances from the for U.S. Hispanics, one of the biggest kind of like most unknown facts is the Roscas, Rotating Saving Club. Is this... People call it Tanda, people call it Susu, people call it Sang. Sociedad has different names depending on the culture, but it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's a rotating saving club that people prefer to save in a rosca or in a group saving mm. club 
or borrow from that group saving club, no APY, no APR. It's just based on trust. So the community is literally pooling money together. And that peer trust has a lowest wow. delinquency rate that when they take a banking product. That's and, 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 and let me tell you why. It's a cultural thing. When you have your money saved on a rosca, which is a forceful way of ser- of saving. And if you ask them, do you save? They say, no, I, I do rosca. Same thing, but well. If you have $100 on a rosca, mm-hmm. and I come to you and I say, can you lend me 100 bucks? You're going to say, oh, sorry, it's an rosca. Now, if you have it in a bank, and I say, could you lend me $100? It's in a bank. Well, go get it. <laughs> so <laughs> even the ex- the excuse f- from a peer-to-peer to just say yes or no, hmm. That plays a role. So wow. we, we figured out that there's this trustworthiness within the community from the peer-to-peer perspective that is much more powerful than their financial behavior that you see in statistics. So if they're wor- trustworthy for their pals, why is the bank not seeing them as credit worthy? Mm. So we, we took a, on that to build on that insight and we said, there is ways to fix this and there's mm-hmm. ways to lend money to this cohort there's a way to transform this cohort of course you have different segments you have the newcomer the recent migrant but you have the later stage migrant and they're all looking they're all looking for different things mm-hmm. but we're starting on a step-by-step uh approach that's amazing what do you feel like if you had to say it in a couple sentences like your ethos your guiding principle that's allowed you to kind of open up this whole niche I think that it's about time, especially in 2024, that people get value for their true worth, especially on the economic side, and not just on a statistic or a score that might not be completely tailored to them. When we built Bana, one of the things we did was we built an infrastructure that had a an embedded risk matrix, a bespoke risk matrix that is tailored to this segment. Mm-hmm. And with it, we are able to see this cohort on a profitable manner, whereas an incumbent will see them, will deem them unprofitable or mm-hmm. are, are unworthy of or or risky. Too risky, right. yeah. So that was very important for us to 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 build because this way we can tap into that credit worthiness that we know that exists now so we need to uncover that yeah that's and, so powerful and unlock you know access to millions and millions of people yeah it's like um you know it- we it's just cultural to me cuz you know like there's this american standard of worthiness and credit and risk and all of this and it just it truly can't be applied to other populations and like there has to be that global perspective um i think what you're doing is incredible how can our listeners get involved and like use your product is it literally just download the app yeah it's download the app it's it's you can open an account you can share it but also if you're a business, small business owner and you have employees that they need to get paid in cash because they don't find the confidence or the level of trust to go to a bank and look for tons of paper to open a bank account and to answer a, a million questions, refer them to PANA so now they can migrate that physical paycheck or cash paycheck into a direct deposit. Mm -hmm. Because today what's happening is they're getting paid in cash or in paycheck and then they're going to a cash kiosk to send a remittance and they pay a lot of fees. With Bana, you just get a direct deposit and you send the remittance right then and there. Um, And so, yeah, that's that's the way I would say, uh, you know, you could engage. We are launching a new product now, which we're very excited about. It's called Hola Bana. And it's the first financial migration assistant because it felt horrible when I moved into the country and I had to do all of that. Mm -hmm. So Pana, Hola Pana helps you get your first bank account, your first health insurance plan, 
if with unlimited doctor visits, your first phone line, and you actually get personalized consultancies or personalized advice on migration with migration lawyers, with tax advisors wow. and financial advisors, and and many other stuff. So we are very excited about that because that's the stair step to the U.S. That's the that's a welcome to America package, if you may. Mm -hmm. That one stop shop that I needed when I came to the country. Yes. And wow. I know obviously Canada is a lot different, but even as a Canadian just coming across the border, like having to find immigration attorneys, figure out all this paperwork, open up bank accounts, go and get that physical that needs to be done that nobody tells you about. And you can only go to certain doctors. And it's like, you guys, I'm not that fucking different. <laughs> like, how is it this difficult? You know? So I can't even imagine, like, a, there wasn't a language barrier, you, you know? Like, just. So I think, again, I'm totally blown away by what you're doing. We love to talk about failures on this show. <laughs> so well, hopefully you're okay with that. As he called them earlier, learnings. Yeah, right? oppor learning opportunities yeah. or maybe just not the right time, not necessarily a failure. Um, but I do think it's important, you know, like people listening to the podcast, they hear what you're doing. They're like, man, this guy's freaking impressive, right? Level with everyone and maybe share one of the, a story or a time in your life where you were like, this, wh where you are right now, where you're living your life didn't seem possible and what you did. I'd had to go, I'd have to go back to uh, my Suma, mm -hmm. um, my first startup. Um, boy, how many mistakes we, we made and we had no idea, but obviously hindsight 2020, right? So, um, I had this idea. I I started putting it in a piece of paper and then and, and PowerPoint and and very convincing as I've been. I, I I you know I built. I hired a team. I didn't build a team. I hired kind of like outsourced mm -hmm. developers. I didn't have a technical co-founder, um, nor a technical background, and I just said, let let's do it right. Um, and I raced funds from angel investors. And we actually built it. And we actually took it to market. And again, it was ahead of its time. Um, it, The infrastructure wasn't there. The capital structure wasn't there. Um, so, but we had poured all of our hearts, sweat, money, time, savings, everything into this. And it got to a point where it's it's like, well, I have to kill it. It's it's, it's not How going anywhere. How did you know that you had to kill it? Like, was it literally just like you're bleeding money, or was it? No, we we had run out of money, and it was like always waiting for either the new relation to come or a new investor to come to, to, to you know, kind of like try to make it happen, and, and and it was very hard to, you know accept the fact that you know this that had become part of my personality and my image and that ego image that you create based on people around you and that made so many people so proud of you um jesus how do you take all of that down so yeah. um obviously it, it came to a point and we we had to close it and it was very hard. It was excruciating. Before we closed it, I had panic attacks. Mm -hmm. I had imposter syndrome. I had so many things that went went by, and I really suffered a lot. And my my wife was, you know, very close to me when when that was happening, and she she suffered a lot. Yeah. And so it. When we closed it, it it really closed the chapter. It really took a toll on us as a family, as a marriage. Mm -hmm. um, and you know how you go through mourning after a, a death? I had to mourn for many months. And a suddenly an insecurity kicks in because when, and, and it still happens today when you're pitching to an investor and he says no. You feel it's a referendum on you. Mm -hmm. It's not on the products, not on the company. You're like, how what? could you? You go back to that uh, that space, right? You, you, yeah, yeah. You, you, have, you have like PTSD, right? So, yeah. you, but it's 
it is impossible to to not take it personal. Yeah. But but it is not personal. It's it's a business, right? So, but Masuma, I learned a lot. We learned a lot. In fact, it made me the entrepreneur I am today. And I I, I knew what not to do because I of the failures that I have I already had. Mm-hmm. Um, when I was about to pitch my wife with Bana, she had the PTSD. She was like, no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 not no. again. No, no, seriously, <laughs> you're kidding, right? Aww. And so it was very hard. But I sometimes I try to tell people that I don't have a choice. I feel I was born to do this and I need to do it. And the CEO of NVIDIA, which is kind of like the Taylor Swift of tech right now. Right. Um, you know, NVIDIA is one of the most valuable companies in the world right now because of AI and, and all. He said when he was asked, would you do it again? He said, no. <laughs> and, and, and the reason... Everyone expects a different answer. Right. right? And but... the reason why is because knowing what I know now, I would never put myself through that again. Mm-hmm. But thankfully... I didn't know what I know now because, and and I, I'm going to try to paraphrase him. He said, the superpower that an entrepreneur has is that we are able to say, why not? How hard could it be? That, you know, just try that leap of faith. And then the ability to, you first, you, when you start something, you're singing a cappella. It's like... Um, yeah. There's no one singing with you yeah. until someone says uh, another person crazy enough to sing along with you is going to be okay. And and there there's a choir and then everyone starts believing in you and it's very easy to buy a, a, an Apple stock, right? Right. But it's very hard to invest in a, in a in an early stage startup. So that leap of faith I think is is very important and yeah. It's almost like an inspired ignorance that us entrepreneurs have because it's like if you knew what you were in for you like like you said you probably wouldn't do it, right? So it's just this like this this um like not fearing the unknown, right? Like I don't give a fuck what's over there. Sorry that I cuss. I don't give a shit. That's still a cuss word. <laughs> I don't care what's over there. I can get through it. I'm going to, you know, succeed. It doesn't matter what comes. And 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 yeah, and for all of if people listening to this podcast, there's there's something that Sometimes when someone called me, oh, you're just, or told me you're just being naive. Hmm. Well, I think that's that's naiveness or whatever mm-hmm. that makes you take that leap. Yeah. Because the truth is, no one under on, on their righteous mind would do this if you if we were to calculate the risks, you know, the the uncertainty and the ups and downs. No one sane enough, <laughs> of sound mind, on a sound mind, will do it. Because yeah. it's crazy. So yeah. y- you got to somehow be able to have a glitch on your mental algorithm to take that out and just pick up on the good stuff because that's the only way you can k- get through it. That's that's the word that I was thinking, you know, while you were kind of explaining that. And I was thinking of that for us. I was like, yeah, it's kind of like this naivete to just, the, the, the naivete, to just be like, yeah. okay, let's, let's go. Ignorance. Yeah, um, 100%. Love it. So we know what's next with Olapana. Yeah. Um, what are you hoping for for growth for or for the next five, ten years? Where do you want to see things go as a company or as a team, as a developed partnerships, yeah. whatever? What are you looking for? So we're building a challenger bank um, because we we we're we have seen that big banks have a bigger fish to fry, and that there's a big opportunity of building the banking platform for it's not sixty million; it's going to be a hundred million U.S. Hispanics and in in a couple of decades so we're building that platform now how do we get there i we see kind of like three stages right, right now we are banking this banking cross border and portable financial history those are the three stages that we see on the first one we see bank we're starting with banking the recent migrant right mm-hmm. first year you're into the country now what about those people who are been here for a while what about them if you look at what they're doing, they're sending $150 billion of remittances every year to, to LATAM. And now they need more because 83% of that is cash-based. Now they want to invest. Mm-hmm. 
Now they want to buy real estate. Now they want to pay healthcare directly. Now they have products on both countries, financial products, mortgage, in, in, in DR, as an investment, for instance, things like that, right? So how can we serve them? That's the second stage on, on, on phase one. On phase two, we are we look to broaden and deepen our, our corridors. We um, we seek to volatize the remittance. So and we intend to continue to grow in just not only adding more countries where you can send remittance, but having both the sender and the receiver be a Pana customer. So this way you can actually close that loop and have an instant better experience when you're moving money because it shouldn't be difficult. It should be like sending a picture through WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. That's how easy it should be. Now, three, once you've built this closed loop, now you can fix one of the problems that I faced when I came into a country was, which is I could not pack my credit score in my backpack when Mm -hmm. I came here with my suitcase. Take it with you. So we want to build a portable financial history where you're able to migrate from bo- from country to country and you are still you. Yeah. And your your credit history moves with you. You have your your Pana score. How can we leverage that? And 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 I'll close up with in 2030, 2040, whenever that is, I don't think we will end up having built a new bank. I don't think it's gonna look like a bank. I think it's going to look some somewhat like a platform that converges or merges content, marketplace, and financial services. And and I think with the state of Gen AI or 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 AGI or artificial general intelligence, I think this will come to a point where it is so smart, and the content is tailored based on your own health, financial, and personal information that is very relevant. Mm -hmm. And it's actually going to save a lot of money on marketing for companies that are wasting money in people who are not their target. Exactly. So I think as we close the gap between supply and demand and reduce that waste that is a waste of not having the right information, the right data, and therefore, a lot of people are pushing marketing and pushing a lot of money and trying to get to the customer. And you, you can save a lot of that money when you streamline the connection between supply and demand. Awesome. Very, very fascinating. We're uh, super impressed with everything you've done. It's um, a really cool story. And uh, thank you for sharing the failure piece uh, with the audience. I know it's sometimes personal and it kind of takes you back there, but it it's important for everybody. We all have them, so I love it. Mm-hmm. No, no. Thank you, guys, because first of all, none of this is going to matter if if Pana doesn't continue to be a success. So we have a lot of work to do. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm humbled by the challenge ahead. I'm optimistic, uh, but I'm also energized by, by the road that we have traveled. So, yeah. No. And the timing's perfect. Yeah. Go back to that. So if um, our listeners wanted to connect with you, follow you, watch this journey unfold, where's the best place for them to find you personally? Anywhere, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, um, and uh, wherever, Piero Nunez del Risco or Nunez del Risco. Uh, Pana is holapana.com. Um, you could also use joinpana.com or whatever works best, but um, yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks again for being here. No, please. Ethos Effect listeners, thank you guys. We appreciate you. We love having you on with us every single week as we interview these amazing entrepreneurs disrupting their respective industries. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and we will see you next week.